And now let me introduce CANWCC member and your presenter today, Tanya Woods Richardson. The creator of the Cashflow Canvas, Tanya Woods Richardson is a nationally recognized expert on small business budgets and founder finance, who just also happens to be the founder and CEO of Nail the Numbers, Canada's go-to financial training agency for entrepreneurs. Her 30 plus years immersed in entrepreneurship has afforded her the opportunity to collaborate with countless banks, credit unions, developmental leaders, and small business champions towards strengthening the minds and the bottom lines of Canadian founders. Without further ado, let's welcome Tanya. Yay! Ah, uh, Jenna, thank you so, so much. It's great to be here again. Thank you for the invitation, always. Um, it's, I, I, I'm a little under the weather today, so we're going to get it through here. But if I need to cough, whatever I need to do, um, hopefully you'll bear with me on that. Um, I am delighted to chat with you about money and finances. And I'm so proud of all of you for showing up because it's usually not everybody's first uh, and foremost um, excited thing to, to join. A lot of people would rather go and probably get a root canal versus come and talk about financials. So I'm gonna make it painless today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, my goal is to make it fun with all of you on the call. Um, so I do have one favor to ask you, especially because we're a smaller group today. I see Mayor Cruz, thank you for showing up powerfully with your camera. Stephanie, thank you. Um, Shannon, Bev, Jennifer, I know maybe you weren't expecting this. I don't know what's going on behind this. Oh, oh I see Jennifer braving it. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Shannon and Bev, if you have the opportunity to turn your camera on, we're gonna make this really interactive. My goal is not to speak for the next hour to you. I want to speak with you. So, um, oh, you're driving, Shannon. So just be careful. Um, but thank you so much. It's great to see you. And we'll we'll go through some of this together because we are we are a small group, and so we can make it more interactive for sure. So my objective today is really to get you to look at your numbers hopefully different, um, if it, with a different lens. Well, maybe just even look at your numbers, right? I don't know how many of you actually even look at your numbers every week, let alone every month. The, the stats that we have taken a look at is that usually most businesses will look at their financial statements four months after year end to get a better sense of what's going on in their business. So I'm really looking to, to, to get you to see your numbers differently. And quite honestly, to really get you to take a very different approach to building your business. Because unfortunately, most women that I've worked with in business, and I'm just calling it like it is, I shoot from the hip, have built lousy paying jobs for themselves versus financially solid, secure, stable business models. So everything I'm going to chat with you about today, it comes from 30 years of experience, but it actually really stems from, and I'm gonna to cut to the chase, and that is that in 2009, my business went bankrupt. So not this business, obviously, it was a former business, and it was a business that I had for eight years. And I actually had 3.5 million in revenue. We had 14 employees, but behind the curtain, I hadn't paid myself for six years. I was putting payroll on credit cards and I actually sold my house and put the equity of my house into the business because I thought that really success has got to be just around the next corner, realizing that I had 2,500 members, that I had the revenue, but the tragedy in all of this is that I didn't have what we call the net profit. So my sales were strong but I had zero net profit. I was actually operating from a deficit position. And the reality is that 89% of business owners are generating less than a 2% net profit. So at that time, just so you know, I was pregnant. Uh, my ex, my partner at the time, he was going through um, stage, uh, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was given a 2% chance to live. He had a Ducati dealership that was bringing close to 15 million in revenue. And his business was going bankrupt too. 
because in 2009, no one was buying $80,000 motorcycles. And so he was going through bankruptcy. My business was going through bankruptcy. We had a baby, we had the cancer scare. All of this to say that when I finally found the space to breathe, I actually went back to my numbers. It took the bankruptcy for me to go back to my numbers and actually take a look at where did this all go wrong? That's what it took for me. And what I realized is that my revenue model, my financial model was broken and it was broken from day one and nobody caught it. Not the accountants, not the bookkeepers, not the angel investors. One of them put in $250,000 and nobody caught it. So after I learned how to build solid financial models, I actually became a lender and I worked for the Canadian Youth Business Foundation. I had a, a portfolio of $5 million to get business owners started with their business with loans of 40,000, no 45, I think it was at the time. And what I learned through that experience is that after looking at hundreds of cash flow projections, A, the vast majority of founders didn't know how to build a healthy financial model. And more importantly, I also got to look at credit reports. And when I looked at credit reports, I realized this is a silent epidemic that's killing off small business owners. So that's when I made up my mission. It was 2014 that I started up Nail the Numbers. I said, it's time to empower founders to take control of their numbers because this is the work that only you can do. We can't abdicate it to the bookkeeper. The role of the bookkeeper is, to, and I know they hate this, I get, we work with bookkeepers and they hate it, but the role of the bookkeeper is to enter in the data, get it organized and tell you what they're seeing with that data. Some of them will actually get into consulting now. Primarily the role of the accountant is to mitigate your taxes. And there are fractional CFOs out there that you can invest in, but again, they don't necessarily know what's happening in your personal space, nor do they know what you, what you want to build. So ultimately, this becomes your responsibility to figure out the numbers. And so today, I want to give you a couple of tools that will dispel some of the, the costly myths that, that are out there, but also, again, to get you thinking about your numbers differently. So just really quickly here, well, actually not quickly, I'm going to, because I always try to figure this out, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to keep, I apologize, I am going to jump back and forth from the screen to seeing all of you, because again, I want to make it interactive. Um, so just bear with me when this is tiny. I have a hard time. There we go. All right. Okay. So here we go. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk, uh, we said sale, we're going to talk a little bit about budgets and what we think budgets are. Then we're going to talk about Bottom lines is the title of our of our presentation. And then we're going to talk about Bermuda Triangles. And then I'm going to show you how all, all these components come together so that you can make your financials actually sing and build the business of your dreams, which is it's it's your treasure chest. Your business, you are all sitting on a gold mine, a gold mine, and you don't even realize it. So hopefully this is going to get you to change your perspective a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about budgets here. So in our society, we think of a budget, and this is right from Oxford, as an estimate of income and expenditures set for a period of time, right? How many of you actually budget at home? Just put your hand up. <coughs> no, okay. How many of you budget in business? No, okay. Oh, we got Jenna on there. Okay. So hopefully today you're going to uh, be inspired to potentially look at budgeting. So one of the biggest, um, there's two big misnomers here. One is that the budget is just, is just a record of, of income and expenditures. That's misnomer number one. Misnomer number two, this is so, so important because we train people, we train our kids to do this as well. We tend to budget for what we make, right? So even think about your personal budget. You bring home $10,000 what are you going to do with that $10,000, right? How much of it is going to the mortgage? How much of it is going to groceries? We, we tend to budget so that for the money that comes in, we know where it's going to go out. I'm going to get you to start thinking differently. I want you to start budgeting to understand how much money actually needs to be made. If you are going to do what needs to be done, 
both in your personal life and then in business. So it's about flipping it up on its head, right? It's about doing this differently. How much money do you actually need to earn if you were to do A, B, and C? You have to start thinking that way. Otherwise, you're always going to stay in a place of scarcity and stay stuck. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So how many of you have even really approached the idea of budgeting in business? So I, I know we don't have a huge show of hands on budgeting in business, but have you even thought about the idea and what that could potentially look for you look like for you? Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> so let me just get clear on what the budget is in your business. So in business, when it comes to financial statements overall, and I apologize if this is a little elementary for some of you, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page, because once you understand it, it starts to make sense. When it makes sense, you start to implement it. So in business, when it comes to financial statements, we have three financial statements, three documents that make up a bundle of financial statements. One document is called the balance sheet. The other document is called the income statement. And the third document is called the cash flow statement. Now, all of these statements, they can be for the, the, the past performance or they can be for future based performance. Now, the balance sheet, and I'm just gonna equate this to personal finances for a moment so that it will make sense for us. The balance sheet in business is a list of all of your assets minus all of your liabilities. And the difference becomes shareholder equity. So if we were to take the example of a house, let's say we bought a house and the house is $500,000. It's valued at 500,000. On the asset side, we would have a house that's valued at 500,000. The liability, let's say we have a mortgage with our bank for 250,000. So on the liability side, the mortgage would be 250. What would be the shareholder equity then? And just take your mics off. The difference between the, uh, uh, the value and the mortgage. You got it, Beth. So what, that would be 250 then? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So that's exactly it. So the asset, the house is 500,000, the mortgage is 250. That means share and shareholders equity is 250,000, right? What if the house value were to drop, right? In 2008, everything tanked. So now that house becomes valued at $200,000. The liability, has that changed at all? Has the mortgage changed with the bank? No, so that's still 250. What is the shareholder's equity? Just take your take your mic off mute. Can you have a negative equity? You have a negative equity. You're absolutely right, Bev. Thanks for the courage to put that out there. That is the problem. That's what happened in 2008. That's what happened for me. So for all of you, even your business, this, our goal in business is to start increasing that equity position. So that's the balance sheet. The income statement is actually just a summary of your cash flow. But on your income statement, you see things that you don't typically see on your balance sheet. You might see income from the house. Now, not a great example because I don't know, maybe you're renting out a room or your Airbnb in the basement or something or basement suite. So you would see the income. And then what indirect costs <clears throat> do you think you would see on your income statement if it were a house? Utilities, taxes. You got it. Is. That's exactly it. That's exactly it, Beth. So that's what you're going to see over here. And so income minus all your direct costs equals gross profit. Gross profit minus your indirect costs then we end up with what we call net profit. So now the cash flow, <clears throat> this is AKA your budget. Your cash flow is, it's actually just your income statement, but it is detailed. It goes through all your different revenue streams, all of your different indirect costs and direct costs for an extended period of time. Typically it's for a 12 month period. And then again, 
at the end of it all, we end up with what we call the net profit. Now, how many, what percentage of business owners are generating less than a 2% net profit? Anybody remember? Whoop, whoop. I know <laughs> you're a cruise. You're like, what? I don't know. I see the look on your face. It was 89%. 89% are generating less than a 2% net profit. I'm going to speak to that in a moment. But here is one reason why net profit is so important. Because that extra money that we're supposed to have is what we move over to the balance sheet under something called retained earnings. It's an asset and we move it in and it starts to build up the value of our business. I mean, it's, there's a couple of other reasons why this net profit is so important, but unfortunately, most business owners don't even plan for net profit. They don't intentionally build the budget for net profit. Most business owners are barely breaking even and not even paying themselves a fair wage in the process, right? So we totally got to change that. So all of this to say that really, when you do this properly, your budget is your treasure map. It actually shows you how you get from where you are to where you need to be. Not about, oh, I make 10,000, what am I going to do with that? It's about, you know what, I need to make $17,532,000, how am I going to get there? Does that make sense for everyone? Okay, so one of the things that I love to do at Nail the Numbers, because I'm extremely pragmatic, and when I ask most founders, I'm going to ask, sorry, when I say founder, I mean business owner, entrepreneur, just to be clear, and I'm going to ask all of you this right now, what do you actually need to build? So we, I mean, we talked about, you know, what does your budget need to be? We talked about what number are you actually aiming for? What is that, what is that golden ticket for you? How many of you know what you're actually in the process of building? So Jenna saying she doesn't know. What about everybody else? Please just give me, let me know you're still, you're still alive, you're still working with me, you're still, I know Bev is. Stephanie. How many of you know what you need to build out of your business? How many of you know that goal? Just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Bev does not know. Stephanie, you do not know. Mary Cruz, do you know? Don't know. You don't know. Okay. You're not alone. I'm not saying that to be judgmental. I didn't know either. Most founders, I've been doing this work in entrepreneurship for the last 30 years. There's only two people who have been able to concisely tell me exactly what it was that they were building. One was this amazing woman in a conference in Edmonton. I'm like, how many know? And she said what, what the number was. And the other group was actually Skip the Dishes. I got to work with Skip the Dishes. I was their first $45,000 through CYBF. And they knew they wanted out in five years for 10 million because they knew exactly what they were doing with that money on the other side. A skip, skip the dishes was not, it was not an accident. Their success was not accidental. They very purposely went in, five-year plan, out for 10. How are we going to get there? Does that make sense to everybody? That's when you achieve a goal. Like, think about it. If you're building a house, do you start building a house without knowing what you're building? Absolutely not. And the vast majority of founders have started building a business with zero idea of what they're actually building. And unfortunately, most women just from the, 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 the love and the kindness in our heart, and I say this because a lot of us are martyrs, we do it because we want to make the world a better place because we love what we do and we want to see others succeed. But for most of us, we've been self-sacrificing. So we've been lifting others up while we've been sacrificing our financial security. All right. So here's the opportunity. I'm not going to get into this um, a ton right now, but there's a QR code. Jenna's got a link. And we do a five-day wake-up call challenge. It's for founders who are willing to confront their personal financial situation. Because at the end of the five-day challenge... Here's what you end up with. You end up with, this is all about your personal finances. You're going to know exactly how much money the business needs to pay you every month 
so that you are taking care of your savings account, your spending, your debt repayment, and setting the right amount of money aside every month for investments and taxes. So everything that I talked about from a budgeting perspective, this is allowing you to build your personal budget from the bottom up. So what do you need to be earning? That's one number that comes out of this. So now you have a goal for the business. The other goal that you get out of the wake up call challenge is you get to see your retirement shortfall. And why the retirement shortfall is so important is because we're, an ex we're experiencing a 13.4 trillion dollar deficit for retirement needs come 2050. And the number one trend that's fueling that is entrepreneurship. Because how many of you are actually even setting aside enough money every month for your retirement needs, let alone barely breaking even, right? Most founders are not. We, like most, most of us don't even set aside our taxes every month and we get stuck with a big tax bill at the end of the year, right? So it is uncomfortable. It's not hard work. It's uncomfortable work. And I'll be there to guide you every step of the way. It's five days. We meet for 25 minutes every morning. And I give you all the tools, I give you the workbook, I give you all the calculators, you're going to show up with other people who are brave enough to actually do this work. Because at the end of that challenge, you will know exactly what you need to build your business into. For starters, right, if you want to build a $20 million business, you can, but this becomes a necessity, right, is to make sure that we take care of that. So Jana's put in a coupon code for all of you as um, members, you're, I'm giving it to you for free. I want you to show up powerfully. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Please have the courage to do this work for yourself, for your family, for your future, right? Let's do it together. So we kick off September 22nd, codes in the chat, everything you need. And I'm gonna give you my cell phone app. If you have any questions whatsoever, we can talk about that. Okay, but does that make sense about budgets? What a budget is, it's your treasure map. It tells you exactly how to get from where you are to where you need to be right? When you do it properly, right? And it is not just income and expenses. Does that make sense for everyone? Any questions on what a budget really is? Cash flow statement in, in the business line, it's also called a cash flow projection or cash flow, uh, cash flow pro forma is another word or a forecast. They all say the same thing. It's all that same document, cash flow, aka budget. Clear? There. Okay. And no questions about budgets. Okay. So we broke that one apart. Now let's break apart the bottom line. So this is one of my pet peeves. I have two pet peeves. One is this label of small business. I personally, I can't stand it because it is, I think many of us have bought into it. And that label of small has kept us small. We pay ourselves small. We charge a small price. We have a small bottom line. Uh, nothing drives me more insane. We actually, 41.9% um, of GDP comes from independent business owners, right? Uh, we employ almost 70% of the entire labor force in Canada. We make up 98% of all businesses in this country. We're anything but small. So that's one pet peeve. I'm going to put my soapbox away, but not a fan. The other um, issue I have is with profiting in business. It drives me bonkers. I think that there are definitely some companies that abused profit, but typically when something goes wrong in a business and in society, you'll see media and society very quick to judge a business based on it was all for profit, right? So profit is seen in our society, and I would love to have a conversation with this. So take your mics off and tell me if you see this being the same issue. Profit is seen as greedy, opportunistic, capitalistic, right? What else? What other words come to mind for you when you think about profiting in business and you hear that? What, what comes to mind for you? Right now, the profits that big grocery stores are earning comes across yeah. as not just greedy, but gouging. Yeah, greedy, gouging, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So unfortunately, that that those broad brush strokes has kept the vast majority of founders from profiting in business, right? Where And if we do, we certainly don't talk about it. So please write these down. 
there's three reasons why profiting in business is a must. And that we really, I, we call them stewards of profit. We, as 98% of the business community, have a pivotal role to play in changing the narrative on what it means to profit in business. We, it's up to us to do that. No one's going to do it for us. So reason number one, why profit is so important, it is your safety net. Do you remember if we go back over here, ma, 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 do you remember the sheet where I said that bottom line, whatever the extra is after all of your income minus all of your expenses, whatever that difference is, that goes into a fund called retained earnings. Retained earnings in your personal budget, it's called a savings account, right? And again, we live in a society where we think we save to spend. It's like, oh, we'll build up our savings and then we'll spend it. A savings account is you get that account to a certain number and experts vary. It's either six months of, of operating or 12 months of operating. It depends where you live and how long it's going to take you to recover. But you get it to that number and then you stop saving. Then you actually start investing or maybe you go on a trip, whatever it is that you do. But we need to, Canadians save less than 3% of their income. And believe it or not, pre-COVID, only two in 10 Canadians could come up with $1,000 of cash in the event of an emergency. This is why when COVID hit, everybody ran for benefits in life and in business. Because how you manage your money at home is going to mirror how you manage your money in business. It all, all ties together, right? It all ties together. So reason number one, why your bottom line is key is it's actually your savings. It's AKA in business speak, it's retained earnings. It's your savings account. The second reason why bottom line is so important is let's just follow along. Sorry, I don't have a great example here written out, but let's just hypothetically say, our company is making $100,000. And then after all of our direct costs and indirect costs, our net profit is $2,000. So $2,000 divided by $100,000 is 2%. So I, if this is my business, I have a 2% net profit. Does that make sense for everybody? Oh, cool. Okay. How much does a savings account give you? you were to put all your money into a savings account, what is the interest that you would make on a savings account? Like 1.85? Absolutely. So it's anywhere like 179, 1.85 and around there. Just shy of 2%, right? Is that money guaranteed in your savings account? It is, it's guaranteed with our, and I should know this, and I don't know it right now, it's not coming to mind, but our federal government has a guarantee on savings up to a certain amount so that money can never be lost. How much time did it take for you to deposit that money, transfer it with your online banking into that account? How much time? Five seconds, someone said in the seconds. chat. Yeah, seconds. Absolutely. So. For seconds worth of work, you are making 1.85, 100% guaranteed. And most business owners are putting in anywhere from 48 to 40 to 80 hours per week and making less than 2% at 100% risk. Not only to mention that sometimes they have personal guarantees, liens against their assets, right? Like homes and cars, you've cashed out your savings, your RSPs. I speak from experience because this was me, no judgment. I did it all, right? I've been there, which is why I'm doing this now. So the other reason that your net profit is so important is that, that it is your short-term or your, your periodic return on investment that you are making on your business. So what I will share with you, I know a savings account, zero risk, a couple seconds worth of work, but quite honestly, if you put your money into an index fund, and I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not giving you financial advice here, but an index fund, um, an ETF, you're going to make anywhere from 4 to 11%. So what you need to realize, and I say this with love, is that you're actually choosing to invest your time and your money into 
a losing proposition, like a losing investment. And you don't know you're choosing it, but that's what's happening. But you can turn your business into a profitable investment. And that's why I'm here. I want to show you that. But so number two is your short-term ROI. And then the other reason, this is the flip side of number two, it's actually your long-term ROI. Because whatever that net profit is, by the time you go to sell your business, a valuator will actually take your net profit and multiply it by an industry standard. And it will be a big factor in what determines your purchase price. So if I am generating a $2,000 net profit and I'm in the tech industry, you take 2,000, you times it by 10, without any of the other um, assets or cash flow, that business would be worth $20,000. If I'm generating a $200,000 net profit and I'm in the tech industry times 10, right? There's my $2 million payoff. So that is the second reason why you wanna start building your net profit. Like don't believe the hype about greedy, opportunistic, capitalistic. You actually need to build up your net profit. Number three, how many of you actually want to give back to the world, make the world a better place? Yeah, most women are like, yeah, sign me up. That's why I started my business. It's from your net profit that you're able to have impact. The greater your net profit, the greater your impact. Right? Like That's like Arlene Dickinson. She gives back through net profit. That's how hospital wings are built. That's how helicopters get off the ground. It's through net profit. Businesses don't sacrifice their financial model to go and support the community. It's a portion of their net profit. That's why you need to build it. So those are the three reasons. So please repeat those back to me. Why do you need to build up net profit? Why is it a non-negotiable? I'm patient. I'm not really, but I'm going to pretend to be for this call. Three reasons. Let's get three people chiming in one reason each. Let's do it. So you can give back with your business. Awesome. Impact, right? It's from net profit that we make impact. Thank you, Jenna. What's another one? I know you want to, I can hear you. Well, I can't hear you, Stephanie. I can hear it's your safety right. net. Pardon? It's your safety net. It's your safety net. Absolutely, Stephanie. And the third, it's kind of a, a two-piecer. Bev, your mic's off. I see you ready. <laughs> well, you mentioned that uh, the net profit, the returned or retained earnings is how the business is going to be evaluated when you go to sell. So for that. Absolutely. It is your ROI, your return on investment, both short-term Right, you can do this tonight. You can go look at your 2022 numbers and take that net profit, divide it by your total revenue, and you'll see what your return was. Make sure that it does not include your wages, because oftentimes founders don't, that number isn't even in there. So, yes, your short term ROI and it's your long term purchase price, your long term return. Awesome. Well done, everyone. Okay, so now we get into the Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle is a fascinating place because this is where most founders lose their profit. It's in this tricky little area of what we call revenue streams, direct costs, and price points. So all of these are found in your budget, right? We've got revenue up top, we have direct costs equals gross profit, and then we have all of our indirect costs and then we have our net profit as we've gone through. So I just wanna give you some tips because this is actually the work that we do, hence this next slide. We're here to help you with all of this, but I want you to understand um, the, the, the fundamentals of these three categories because this, I guarantee you, I will eat my knickers if you are not <laughs> losing money here right now. Every single time we do this with a founder, this is where they find all of their profit. So the first thing that we would get you to do is to really clarify what are your top three to five revenue streams? What are the top three to five products or services that generate over 80% of your revenue? 
Now, most founders either have way too many, like 35, which is just a crutch to keep them from having to really go after those, those three to five that they know will generate the revenue. For some founders just don't even have enough. They just have one big lump called sales. Again, just another crutch to not go out and sell their product or service. So with revenue streams, with products, it can be a little bit easier, right? So for example, if I'm a baker and I am baking buns, I have my individual bun, I have my bags of buns, or I might do wholesale where they're getting the 20 bags of buns, right? What you might find in this case is they might say, you know what, my core revenue streams are the bags of buns and or the wholesale. It's not to say that you don't sell everything else. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying that you get really focused on, on what you know your money makers are. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. Now, there's one other caveat here. How many of you offer service? Bev, Jenna, Stephanie, okay. A lot of women do services. So here's the issue with services. How many of you sell hourly services? Yeah, 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 okay. I'm going to ask you to change that because you are not being of service to your client. So what we do at Nail the Numbers is we get you to build a package based on the solution that you're actually offering. People don't want you by the hour. They want the solution. What are you giving them and what is it going to take for you to get there? So we've got some time. Who wants to do some hot seat coaching so we can see how we would bundle this into a revenue stream? Anybody want to give it a go? Crickets, I need my cricket app. Cricket app. Stephanie, you want to give it a go? Yep, she says with enthusiasm. Yes. Yes. Okay, let's do it. So <clears throat> Stephanie, what is your service? My service is um, offering a path, uh, mindfulness, and um, movement to help women heal from uh, body image dissatisfaction, you know, your mm. dieting, chronic dieting, and eating disorders. Okay. So in your experience, Stephanie, um, what are people, what is the end result that they're most, that they're looking for? Uh, to be free of these issues so they can move ahead in their lives and accomplish what they want. Uh, also, coping school uh, coping tools are very essential as well. Awesome. Okay. So for them to start to experience that idea of feeling free, right? And for them to actually go, oh, I'm seeing the results. I'm actually feeling this 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 idea of I can see the light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. on average not always but on average how much time would you need to work with the client to get them to that space Ooh, it depends on the client um I would say at least three to six months okay so big gap there right three mm -hmm. to six I'm hearing anywhere from 10 to 20,000 right I'm just throwing a number out there so here's, if, if I were working with you, here's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. I would recommend we have our starter package and our started pack, our starter package is three months. It gets you this many hours. It gets you these products. And I don't know if you offer product, but here's the tea, here's the, whatever might go in that, but it's their entire startup kit that makes them feel like they're in good hands and on the right path. Mm -hmm. Right. Once the starter kit happens or, or once that starter kit is sold, then what is it? Is it a monthly maintenance? Right. Or do you need to go above and beyond with additional support if required? But the big challenge with services is when we just say hourly is that and I'm going to use an example of a woman that I work with that does um, hair restoration. So she works with a lot of cancer patients, specifically women that mm -hmm. are going through cancer and losing their hair in the process. And she would say, well, we, you know, we do hourly services. And when we understood that her clients are coming to them in a time of great distress, 
what they want is they want a solution. They don't want to have to figure out how much time is needed and how many hours are needed, right? Because if, if it's not locked in for them, then it's just ambiguity. And they think, I would say right away to you, I would say, well, how many hours are required? And then the more information you're giving me that isn't locked in, the vaguer and vaguer and vaguer, and the more you're asking me to do the work and figure out what it is that I need, where we really just want to show up for that client, right? So I have a question, though, about how you would charge for that. If you charge normally uh, an hourly fee for your services, how would you put that into a program or package? Okay, so how many, if you're doing three months, right? And I'm just saying it, it, that's as an example, how many hours would go into that? Would you recommend one session a week? Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, so one session okay. a week for 12 weeks gives mm -hmm. you, and I. this is not how we do pricing, but you can see then that we've got a framework. Okay, the starter package, and you might call it something very different, right? That aligns mm -hmm. with your brand and the value that you're offering, right? And so the big key when you're pulling together your revenue streams is that you're getting really clear on what is the solution being provided. So for example, if I'm a design, oh, sorry, I'll finish the example with the hair company. So what she did, she, she said that she did, and I forget that trichologist, I guess, hourly consultations. What she actually ended up doing is bundling it all together. It includes this many hours and these products. So just so you know, we've got you taken care of, your hair's gonna grow back. We do all of these services for you, but it wasn't leaving it up to the client to figure out how many hours, right? Because they just, then it's just a running ka-ching, 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 right? And they don't know exactly what they're getting and they don't know exactly if there's going to be a solution, right? It's like the same thing if you were to go to a lawyer, lawyer, oh, we bill hourly, right? And you're like, what? Right? Like, what do you mean? Well, how many hours is it going to take is the first thing they're going to ask you. So we need to get it clear, not only for us and budgeting, but we need to get it clear so that the customer feels like we're the expert and we know exactly what is needed for them. Now, that's also going to define for you what is in scope and what is out of scope. So you can say in scope is you get one session per week, you're getting these materials. You will also know, and I'm gonna to come to that in direct costs, you will also know that it includes three follow-up calls, four check-ins, right? You're gonna know exactly what that client's going to get for that package. You will also know what is out of scope. So now if they send their daughter for to you, right? That's out of scope. That's a whole separate thing. Or they come to you and say, oh, you know what? I'm now feeling stressed about this body image. That, that's out of scope. Here's what you are dealing with. And out of scope is billed separately at this rate. Does that make sense? So that's really, really important for everybody to lock in on what their core revenue streams are. And especially if your service, pull it together in packages. Bookkeeping services, bookkeeping one, bookkeeping two, bookkeeping three. It's not to say that your lines won't get blurred, but it is to say that you're going into it with a plan and you're actually protecting the integrity of your time and your hours. So that's what we mean by revenue streams. Now, direct costs, direct costs are, are the funds that you are out of pocket to sell a product or service, right? It's pretty self-explanatory, but if I'm, if I'm selling a glass of lemonade, it's the, it's the juice, it's the ice, it's the glass, if it's a you know disposable glass, it is um, a napkin maybe. It is also merchant fees. Right, so I'm going to get to that in a moment here. But direct costs, when you're calculating direct costs, we have four different categories. We have our first category of materials. And so everybody usually gets that. And you might be surprised in services, you might have material costs. They might be thank you cards. It might be postage. It might be delivery charges, right? So we have material costs. We have, a <coughs> we have another direct cost, which we call inputs. So inputs, again, remember direct costs are directly attached to selling a product or service. So inputs can often be commission. It could be freight, it could be shipping, it could be duties. It is also your merchant and transaction fees. So every time you sell something, who's dinging you? 
your 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 credit card suppliers, right? That's anywhere from two to three percent of what it is that you're selling. So right there, that's two to three percent that you can add right to your bottom line if you put it into your direct costs. The third category under direct costs is what we call subcontractors. So these are individuals that you hire in. So maybe Stephanie, in your case, it might be another practitioner who's not an employee that you're bringing in specifically because of their expertise in one core area. So <coughs> you're hiring them only to deliver for that product or service, right? That's a subcontractor. So those are usually pretty self-explanatory. <coughs> Sorry. And um, I would say most founders are usually fairly close on their direct costs. So let's say we're selling something at $100. We think our direct costs are 50. And then we actually do the real math with inputs and everything. And maybe it comes out to 57. So most founders are pretty close. The work we do with you, and I want you all to take this into consideration now, because this is when you fall off your chair, is you have to calculate what is called direct labor, also known in the finance world as a contribution margin. So how we do it is we would get you to write out all the tasks. What are all the tasks that go into selling that product or service? Oh, we have a discovery call. Oh, we set them up in QuickBooks. Oh, we have to hire the subcontractors. Oh, we've got to get the invoice out. Oh, we, you know, and so your list goes on and on and on. So you write out the tasks, you write out the fair market rate. So who is the right person to do that job? And what is the fair rate? Not what you've been paying yourself and not the friends and family discount, because most of us are just squeaking by. But if, if you had to go to market and find someone to do that job, what would be the rate that you would have to pay them to get that job done, right? And then you actually multiply it by how much time is required. When you do that math and we do that with you, that's when you're like, we, we, we thought it was 50. By the time we did materials, inputs and subs, it was 57. By the time you do direct labor, I promise you it, it is likely going to be closer to 80 to $90. Most founders realize at the end of doing this math that they are barely breaking even on their price. And in some cases, founders have been paying their client to do business with them. This is so important to do this work. So you pick your revenue streams, you do your direct costs per revenue stream. You have to do that math. And then once you understand what you're out of pocket, then we move into something called the weighted pricing process. So most founders base their price based on what the competition is doing, right? We're like, ah, you know, Jane down the street is only charging $95. Jane down the street, do you know that 98% of businesses go bust within the first five years? And so most founders are basing their price based on competition that's going down, right? We're going to get you to base your price based on what the competition is doing, what your direct costs are, and most importantly, especially um, especially for, uh, for women founders here is to really understand the value that you're providing, because it's been our experience that many women founders discount what it is that they do. We're having a really hard time recognizing the value of what we offer. And so we're not comfortable charging that price. So the weighted pricing process takes you through all of that so that you, you can't hide from it anymore. You're very clear on what that value is. So I share this with you because this is where everybody is losing their profit. Clear on what the revenue streams are, direct cost per revenue stream, and then setting the price that is based on value, competition, and costs. And that transforms your entire financial trajectory. So that's the work we love to do with you. I gave you some framework there on how, how that works. Um, we offer a financially fierce formula, which is basically, it's that math, it's that exact same process, but we get you to the end spot. Where's the end spot that you need to be? Anybody remember? We kind of talked about that with the wake up call. This comes back to what you need to build is making sure that you can get your retirement needs taken care of. So if your shortfall is $750,000 in retirement, 
let's turn your business into a business that's going to be worth $750,000. You can all do that. It is so easy with the numbers, right? And in the process, <coughs> this business also needs to pay you. <coughs> Excuse me, well. This business also needs to pay you what we call your stronghold number when you need to be earning. So short term, you need to be earning what you need. Long term, we need that retirement number. <coughs> Sorry, I am um, struggling. Good thing we're coming to the end because I'm losing my voice. Um, just so you know, we get a lot of founders who when they come in and they do this work with us, usually the biggest feedback that we get, and, and it, it happens each and every time, is that most founders say, <coughs> I didn't realize there was a process to actually learning how to profit in business. I didn't realize that the numbers came together in a way that will just always show you how to, how to, how to profit. And so this is the work that we do. And just so that you can see, we start with indirect costs. <coughs> we then move to revenue streams. We do direct costs with you. We do price points. Then once we've got that, what actually happens is the calculators do all the work and it tells you what your sales need to be. So when we get to work together in the wake up call, that stronghold budget will tell you what your personal budget needs to be. When we work with you in business, the formula will tell you what your sales and business need to be. It'll say you need to sell X number of units of one, X number of units of two, X number of units of three. Like it'll just, it'll map it out for you. So we then know your sales goals then we build a marketing strategy with you. Again, there's nowhere left to hide that will show you exactly how you sell those units. And then we reverse engineer what we call the formula into a three-year financial plan that shows you exactly how you get from where you are to where you need to be. And that's what we call the financially fierce formula. So <clears throat> I hope I've given you enough tools to get started. My goal with this was to get you to think about your numbers differently, to see them differently, and hopefully to explore them now, especially that net profit and what you've been making and thinking about your business as a potential investment, right? How many of you are, are, are curious now to look at those numbers and see what your business has been doing for you as an investment, okay? <clears throat> now, I'm going to put this screen up. This is my personal email. That's our website. Um, I didn't, I didn't put myself, this is <coughs> our tool free. We can book a call. Um, we actually, I'm going to stop the share. Uh, I actually do something. I'll, I'll do it with you. If you like, it's called the highways and hazards, and it will actually go through your past numbers as dollar values. And we'll chart it in a calculator that will show you exactly where you've been losing money and where you've been making it. And then that will give you a better idea of, of where to start on the financially fierce formula. So a couple of off offers there today. You've got the wake up call. <clears throat> I can see that Jenna's put everything in there in the chat. Thank you so much. So we've got the wake up call. You've got the free access for that. So don't, don't miss out on that opportunity. And then you've got my cell phone number. I can look at your numbers. We can do the highways and hazards together so that you get an understanding of where you've been losing money. And then when you get your wake up call numbers, we can transform your business together and make sure that we can get you from where you are to where you need to be. You need to know that number. You need to know it, right? Because that's the first point in creating anything. Know what you're creating. So important, so important. Jenna, am I missing anything? I'm kind of looking at the chat, but is everything good? Yeah, I think so. Like this was again, another incredible chat. I have pages of notes again for my own business. So like the last time I was just like three pages deep in notes. So like, thank you so much, Tanya, for coming here and presenting this and what you do with Nail the Numbers. It's just so great to be with you and your insights into the, the numbers in our business and how we can get more profit is incredible. Like, uh, I'm so thrilled that you invented Nail the Numbers so that we had this resource for entrepreneurs. So thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you, Jenna. Thank you again, um, ladies, for being here and investing your time. Again, I know numbers aren't super fun for everybody, but hopefully you're looking at this in a new way because you're extraordinary leaders, right? And you're anything but small. And if we take this on, then not only are our kids learning from us as well, but other entrepreneurs look to us to be those role models. So thank you for having the courage to be here. Jenna, always thank you for the invitation to be able to share this info. Um, 